So we have a question from Andre. How do you get that fat in your face snare sound? And what's your tip to get a really distorted rock guitar bass sound heavy and so well defined? Thanks. So two parts. First, how do I get that fat in your face snare sound? Um, I'll say, first off, the key to any great sound is the drummer and the source. You can have a great sounding snare drum, but a really bad drummer is not going to make it sound good. You can also have um, a great drummer and a really bad sounding snare, and that's not going to help either. So my secret ingredient is a guy named Mike Fasano. He's my drum tech of choice, and um, he has a great collection of snare drums as well. And on every session, I try to get him there to tweak the drum kit um, and to get the best possible sound for that particular drummer. Um, it's really a basic, uh, super simple technique. Really, I don't do anything crazy. There's no voodoo. There's just minimalistic miking, usually one snare mic on top, a snare mic on the bottom, usually both SM57s, although I experiment with different um, bottom snare mics. Sennheiser 441, Beta 57, so many things, and, and I commit to the sound. I bust them both together in a certain blend that I like. I compress them maybe through a focus ride red and a little bit of API EQ, maybe just a crack at 10K or at 3K or at 5K. And uh, if I'm looking for a little more fatness, um, I usually ask Mike to try to get it or the drummer to try to get it by changing heads, changing snares. Um, and something we discovered this week, you know, I, I stressed a lot to these guys is that um, it, it's really important for the phase of the drums to be together. And um, a key to the fat snare sound is really making sure that it's in phase with all the other microphones on the drum kit. Because once you, if you have a skinny snare sound, it's amazing just by flipping the phase of the overheads how it automatically becomes fat. So I would highly recommend everybody to get phase switches and put on everything and use them. Uh, part two, my tip to get a really distorted rock guitar and bass sound. Heavy and so well defined. Well, actually, to get a well defined rock guitar and bass sound, the key is to not make it so distorted. Um, you'd be surprised how much preamp distortion sort of gets in the way. And um, I find that if I run stuff a little bit cleaner, when you start doubling, then it, then it becomes heavy and well defined. Um, there's really no trick there either. The same same sort of thing. My favorite two microphones on a guitar amp are a Shure 57 and a Sennheiser 421. Uh, my favorite mic on a bass cabinet could be anything from a 57 to a 421 to a Beta 52 to a Violet Globe. Uh, there's so many. On a on a combo, I might end up with a Royer 121 or a 101 or a 122. The key is just to get the microphones in phase. So usually on a combo, I'll just stick with one microphone, and that's usually a Royer or a fat tube mic or a condenser mic. And on guitars, 57, 421, line them up, make sure they're on, they sound good together. They sound good by themselves. They sound good together and that they're properly in phase. And that's usually the key. And the same thing with bass, making sure the, the mic and the DI are, are well aligned. So that's it. Thank you, Andre, for the question. Question from Bill, how much guitar processing do I do to tape as opposed to after the fact during the mix? Well, a lot of times when I'm tracking, I'm trying to facilitate the process. So I do whatever I need to do to make sure that the, the setup doesn't take forever and that the band is ready to play. And when they're ready to play, we're recording. So a lot of times in the back of my head, I know that I can process after the fact as well. So if, if I'm a little shy on EQ or something's a little dull, I'll maybe just process listening wise on the console, knowing that I'll probably do it when I'm mixing because the guitar player is ready to play and, and we should roll. Um, that being said, I try to get the best sound I possibly can on my way to the tape machine. That way, when I go into the mixing process, I can always enhance that. Um, but really, the key is to, you know, when a band is ready to play, they're ready to play. If the sound isn't perfect, the performance may be great. So better to have a great performance than a perfect sound. Thanks for the question, Bill. This one's from Dan. How much time do I spend on a mix? Ah, uh, well, 
typical mixed day for me is a 12 hour day. I start at noon. I like to work till midnight or one, upload the mix to the band, unless the band's in town attending the mix. Come in the following day at noon with a list of changes that I would like to do from listening in the morning. And also from the one email I received from the band collectively saying, this was great or this was shit. Um, if there's, if it's something that I've tracked, then I usually know where all the bodies are buried. So in that case, it's a lot easier to mix. And sometimes I could do up to two songs a day or three songs a day. And sometimes the songs are super long. You know, mixing an eight minute song is not like mixing a three minute song. It's like mixing two songs. So sometimes it might take up to two days. It sort of depends. Second part of his question, would I rather boost or cut when EQing? I'm a booster. The only thing I might cut is some low, low, low frequencies, but only as a last resort when I try to clean up some stuff, but I'd rather boost than cut any day. And part three, any tips to get great sounding rock guitars? Great sounding rock guitar player, great sounding guitars that stay in tune, well intonated, set up properly for the tuning and the, um, the player. If a player is heavy handed and stuff's going out of tune, use fatter strings, tighter tension. Um, great sounding amplifiers, knowing when to uh, augment a player's sound with something that's going to give them the sound that they're looking for, although they might not know it yet. Using a minimal amount of microphones, sometimes combining microphones for a color instead of EQing them separately, sometimes combining amplifiers for color. Um, and also committing, committing to a sound. I think in general, the part dictates what the sound's gonna be. So a fast guitar part's gonna need to be a little cleaner. A uh, slower guitar part has room to be loose. There's, there's so many variables, but the tip to get a great sounding uh, rock guitar is really to start with the player. Thank you, Dan. Jesse, um, often my drum tom fills take on a life of their own. Do I overdub tom fills while tracking? The only time I ever overdub tom fills is as an effect. A lot of times I like to do tom uh, overdubs to a tape machine and change the speed. If we do tom overdubs with the tape machine running super fast, then when you play the, the tape back normal, the sound of the toms goes down lower. It makes them deeper. Or if you have an ambient space, a lot of times I like to do tom overdubs in an ambient space, like here's a great stairwell and everything we ran into it, including vocal sounded fantastic. So I would have loved to just do some tom overdubs in this room here and just turn up the room mics only. And that would be a great layer on top of that. Um, but general, my toms, um, I don't overdub the toms usually only as an effect. They sound like they do a lot of times because I, I like to process them using an Aphex uh, processor, sort of like the big bottom thing where you can actually tune the frequency in and add a little bit of gain to them and keep them up high. I do a lot of rides when I'm mixing where I turn them up super loud and then lower them down when I, they don't need to be there. Not cutting them out completely because a lot of times the leakage is what you need. Um, so he asks about cymbals as well. Have I ever overdubbed cymbals? Yes, on, on the uh, any time I've worked with the Queens, except for the very first record, which we tracked the drums completely as a normal drum kit. Um, it's always been with overdub cymbals, which is a challenge. You have to be a great drummer to do it. And Joey Castillo is a fantastic drummer when we worked on lullabies together. Um, what we did was set up the drum kit, which is kick, snare, and toms and had him play a fake hi-hat, and that was just a pad that he can hit. So while he was playing drums, he can keep time in the hi-hat, or he would play on his uh, leg if he could. Um, the ride wasn't so bad, because you pretend you're going to a ride cymbal and put a pad to the side. And then I kept the same exact drum setup and pulled all the instruments out and put the cymbals in there. That way I could record not only um, cymbals, hi-hat, and ride, but also some room, and I kept the other mics open if they were you know sounded cool and same sort of thing put some pads in so joey could play a kick and a snare and hear them in his headphones so it didn't feel so unnatural and that that seemed to help so that's really the only time i've done it and uh it seemed to work on lullabies but in general i think it's um it's an odd way of making a drum sound and i'd rather just record a drum kit in its entirety 
Thank you, Jesse. Uh, I believe this is Urban. Um, do I notice a huge difference on sound mixing of my SSL than mixing in the box? I don't really mix in the box at all. I might take some elements and stem them out through a compressor or something like that. For instance, if there's 20 tracks of backing vocals, I might just submix them in, in Pro Tools out of two outputs. But um, I mix on a console for many reasons, especially an SSL, because I just love the way it sounds. It's very easy to get a sound on it because it kind of, in general, cleans the sound of your mix up a little. SSL is uh, not as fat sounding as a Neve and just kind of clear stuff out. Um, also, because I've been doing it for so long, I'm used to using it. Um, and, and it sounds, it has a sound. The mixing in the box is definitely an art, and I've not perfected that art, nor do I wish to try yet. Maybe one day when I can't afford my SSL anymore, or can't afford the electric bill, uh, or the maintenance. Um, and I am more comfortable working on a desk for many reasons. When I mix, I like to perform the mix. I don't like to just draw in with a mouse, uh, vocal rides, or anything like that. I like to actually have the faders in front of me and do vocal rides and do delay rides and reverb rides and push the drum rooms up on fills and kicks and snare rides. So I feel like I'm, you know, building the dynamics and the excitement back in the mix. And it's really a performance based thing. I find that if, if I have to draw it in, then it, there's no more performance. It's just, you know, me and a mouse, which is very boring. So um, that's why I do it that way. Can I explain how I deal with phase shift treatment um, with tools like Voxango, PHA979, or Waves in Phase? Well, first of all, I have no idea what those two things are, so I can't explain them. And the way I deal with phase shift is by moving microphones. That's the key to being a great engineer. Move microphones, move the source until everything is perfectly aligned. If you cannot figure it out, use less microphones. That's the key. Um, when I'm mixing, the way we used to get a bass amp and a DI aligned and in phase was to take the DI and delay it because the delay signal, the, the DI signal is always going to be earlier than the signal going through the DI to the guitar amp, through the speakers, through the microphone, through the preamp, back into Pro Tools or tape. So that inherent delay that happens, you can get better in phase by moving the mic in front of the bass amp or actually delaying the DI with... Um, with guitars, it's really a matter of placing the microphones and then checking that they are in phase together, just flipping the phase of one of them. And, and um, you could do it with Hiss. We demonstrated that this week at uh, La Fabrique. Um, just putting up Hiss coming through a guitar amp and, uh, and flipping the phase on the mic pre and just moving it around so you can hear where the null point is and then coming back in the control room and flipping the phase back. And that's the, the hot spot. That's not to always say that that's the greatest place to keep your, your guitar mics. I mean, sometimes a little bit of out of phase actually help and creates a scoop in the sound that might actually cut through better. So I don't necessarily use any outboard type stuff. I, I, I like the IBP, Jonathan Little's in between phase box when I'm really stuck and I'll throw some stuff through that and maybe move it around a little But Even then, I'd much rather just delay something to move the track or use one less microphone. Okay, from John Paterno, good friend of mine. Where do babies come from? Well, John, the answer is obvious. From the stork, he drops them on you on the city above the house, and that's where they come from. Thank you, John. And from Luca, how did I record the first Queens of the Stone Age record? He read some of it. It was done on a soundtracks board, Rancho de la Luna. Um, I started out at Rancho de la Luna and decided that the room wasn't right for what we were trying to get. And we moved to a studio called Monkey in Palm Springs. And that's where we did the whole record in 17 days. There was a soundtracks console there that belonged to the owner, Steve Feldman. And um, he had a great amount of outboard gear. So a lot of it was cut through. Gear that I brought into the studio and, and Steve's um, he had a lot of Calrec modules, which sounded great, PQ10s or PQ15s, I think. And everything was monitored through the soundtracks and mixed on the soundtracks. And that's where we did it at Monkey. How did I create the thick drum sound on Lullabies to Paralyze? Well, part of the thick drum sound was the fact that we overdubbed the cymbals. 
the uh, the overdubbing of the cymbals allowed me to mic the instruments from a greater distance, thereby getting a bigger, fatter sound. If you mic a tom from an inch or two away, that's you can get a fairly good sound with the right mic and the right tom and the right player. Um, but the only reason you do that is to keep it out of the cymbals. If you remove the cymbals and you mic the tom from a foot away, that's a pretty big drum sound. So that's how we were able to do that. And my approach to mixing the pot by tool, um, God, I, mean, I think I just approach every song pretty much how it sort of dictates how it needs to be mixed. Since I tracked that song, I tracked it. Um, I tracked it in a way that it just kind of unfolded when I was mixing. I mean, this all the pre delays on the vocals and all that stuff was done with, uh, you know, storing tape uh, heads out, so it would. It was real print through and not some kind of fake stuff. Um, and it was pretty straightforward. I mean, it's a great song, great bass playing. The drums were thick, and I remember the guitar being uh, super great too. So, I mean, it's all, they're a great band. So, the sort of mixing tool is fairly easy because uh, it sort of unfolds by itself. I don't, I don't really have another approach other than sort of doing what I do. And the fact that I tracked it was really easy to mix because. I put it all together as I did it. Thank you, Luca. That's it.